But transformation is beyond setting people on fire. They must encounter the God of fire. In the making of a deliverer, there are a few, few layers of dealings you must have to pass through. If you have not passed through there, your journey has not begun. At least your journey of purpose has not begun. The first one is the wilderness experience. The first one is the wilderness experience. What is the wilderness experience? And what is the purpose of the wilderness experience? The wilderness experience is actually a set of circumstances that God passes you through. So that you come to a place where there is nothing you hold on to anymore. You are forced to look unto God alone. It is in the wilderness that all your options are taken away. The Bible said in Exodus. Book of Exodus chapter 13 from verse 17. He said when they left Egypt, he did not let them go through the way of the Philistines. He said even though that was short. Because if they went through that way, they will find war and they will come back. He said, but he let them pass through the way of the Red Sea, even though it was longer. That is when all the garbages in your life are shoved off. You may tell yourself and pray for many days, many months and many years, and you will even be crying when praying, that Lord, I trust you. You are my only hope. But the moment you finish praying, the first person you call is your uncle. <laughs> you see how slippery the deception is. Even while you were praying, you knew your confidence was in your uncle. <laughs> you will do these things for many years, but you will not grow. Because somebody says you lie loudest when you lie to yourself. Somebody needs that and say, I believe in God now. I will do it now. Now. And the moment he leaves that place, he's going to look for alternatives. The only way God secludes you from all those alternatives is to carry you through the journey of the wilderness. The wilderness experience has three purposes. The first one is to engender trust towards God. Trust. Trust towards God. Have you found out any situation in your life where you struggled, struggled, struggled until there was nothing to hold on to anymore? And then suddenly you come to an end of yourself. That's the only time you can look up to God. In order to achieve trust in the wilderness, God carries you through five syllables of experiences or dealings. The first one is the encounter. The encounter. You see, meanwhile, you need to know that the wilderness is a place of separation. Right? You may be in a position where you make up your mind to consciously separate yourself. And circumstances may separate you. Whichever one you stumble into, it is consecration from the world unto the Lord. It is possible to be separated from the world, but not unto the Lord. That's what we have in the church, you know where you find strong believers, they are doing everything in church, but they don't know Jesus and they don't have time for him. They are no longer committing sin, the kind of sin they were committing, but they are not separated unto the Lord. In the wilderness, you are not just separated from the world. You are separated unto the Lord. And the moment you are separated unto the Lord, the first thing you have is an encounter. When encounters begin in your life, know that your consecration is beginning to strike a chord in the realm of the spirit. If you are a Christian and you are, you are not yet having encounters, there is a challenge with consecration. Exodus chapter 3 from verse 1. The Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And came to the mountain of God, even unto Horeb. 
This was the man that ran out of Egypt. Because he saw the oppression of the people of God. And he wanted to use his strength. He is a prince and he is a strong man. So he broke upon an Egyptian and killed him. So he began to wonder how many Egyptians he would have killed before delivering Israel. Even if he was killing them every day. So that was a wrong approach. So God took him out of Egypt. And first of all exposed him to a hopeless circumstance. The prince who lived in the palace was now reduced to carrying sheep to the wilderness. You see, when he was a prince, he had many alternatives. Many options were at his disposal. And if he remained in Egypt, he would still hide within the confines of the authority of a prince. So God took him to the wilderness. And he was a shepherd. So a prince became a shepherd. And he did that for 40 years. You know, if you are doing it for one year, you may think, okay, maybe something will happen in Egypt. They may call you. Maybe your mom will take compassion, insist, cry to the king, and you'll say, okay, we are forgiving you, come back. When you do it for, tw- for 10 years, for 20 years, for 30 years, for 40 years, then the point comes when you know that guy. There's no hope again. You see, when you graduate, you may say you are called into the ministry. You are a full-time preacher. And you are less than 30. So you apply here, apply here, apply here. When you reach 30 years, every job you click, they say 26 years below. <laughs> When you get to that point, then you will now fold your certificates and keep them somewhere. That's what happened to Moses here. All his credentials became irrelevant. So he, he had to fold them. It took 40 years for Moses to fold his credentials and he kept them under the couch. It was at that point that the encounters began. And the Bible said, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush and he looked and behold the bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed and Moses said I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burned so even though he was separated God didn't bother about him until he now chose to turn to God he turned away from the flock and then turned to God that's where you have to be separated from the activity you are doing. Because that you kept your certificate does not mean you are even choosing God. Because you can be coming to church because you are the one on the microphone. They say lead prayer. The day they don't say lead prayer. Or you plan to come and lead prayer. Like as I came now to minister today and Pastor Tony say, please don't worry. Pastor Shala is here now so he will preach. Then you know. That is because you are doing it because you, it's a professional thing to you. You have not turned aside to God. That massive crusade, they say you'll be the one to lead the, sem- the song, the choir leader that day. And then you came, they say, don't worry, don't worry, this person will do it. Then you, the whole crusade, you don't care about it anymore. You don't even bother what God wants to do. They should go to her. It's a professional thing you are doing. So, even though Moses' credentials were irrelevant at this time, he was still conscious about the flock until he had to turn away from the flock to look at God. And the Bible said, and God said, You see, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not, draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. This was the first time everything that was happen, happening to Moses made meaning to him. You see, you don't know why he finished you are in Lagos. God say, come to Obi. Or come to Makodi. Your friends who are in Lagos are already buying cars. But God say, come to Makodi. And then you have been here for 10 years. Nothing is happening. 15 years, nothing is happening. And then suddenly God say, no, where you are standing is a separated ground. Everything that has been driving you all this while was to achieve separation. They were not natural circumstances. These things were orchestrated for my realm. I was doing this thing so that I can bring you to the center of my will, where your destiny can begin from. Concerning your own life, according to the blueprint that was written before the world began, your life is supposed to begin from the center of my will. So if you were in Lagos, it wouldn't have been possible. If you were in Egypt, it wouldn't have been possible. He said, no, no, no. You have come to the spot now, so put off your shoes. He said, where you are standing is a separated ground. 
Now we can begin to do business. So the reason you wanted to kill that Egyptian was not because you were angry. The reason you ran from Egypt was not because you were afraid of Pharaoh. The reason you have been leading the ships was not because you were a shepherd. The purpose is to bring you to a holy ground where you are no longer relevant to anybody in the world but me. He said, take off thy sandals. That was the first time all that was happening to Moses made meaning to him. You can live your life for 10 years in the purpose of God. It doesn't make meaning until you have an encounter. The day you have an encounter, you know, apostles say, life is not measured by time. It's measured by encounters. It's the day you have an encounter that the last 10 years will make meaning to you. If you don't have encounters and you have been following God, sometimes the last 15 years will not make meaning. The last 5 years will not make meaning. The last seven years will not make meaning. But the day an encounter comes, suddenly, everything that seemed to be a lost in the past, you now know that it was an orchestration of the Spirit in order to achieve a purpose that is bigger than you, but has to find expression through you. See, the place that you are standing, he said, is a holy ground. Next verse. So the first thing that you see in the protocol of encounter, of trust, all of these things, is to achieve trust. So God begins to give you encounters. If you don't have encounters with God, you may never trust Him. You will say it a thousand times, but you will never trust Him. Your senses will always speak to you. Your senses will always speak to you. The only thing that shuts down your senses is when you see an encounter. Because in an encounter, first of all, your senses are overwhelmed. So why is the bush burning? And is not consumed. Everything he knew, all his ideologies were shattered down. And God began to speak. So encounter is the first thing that achieves trust towards God. And you only find it when you make the choice of separating yourself. That separation is what we call the wilderness experience. So the wilderness is not a place to suffer. It's a place to achieve trust. Hallelujah. The second thing is knowledge. The knowledge of God. You can know about God, you won't trust Him. I assure you. Only until you know God, you will never and you can never trust Him. That's why every one of us here know about Jesus. But we cannot do what Jesus asks us to do. And the Bible said in James chapter 1 verse 20, He said, Thou believest that there is only one God, thou doest well. He said, The devil also believes and even trembles. So the devil actually believes in God more than you. The only difference between you and the devil is your own obedience to God. He opposes the purposes of God. So his belief is not relevant. He said, The devil also believes and trembles. You, you believe, you don't even tremble. Have you not seen that time when you are in the presence of God and you cross your leg and you are, I love you, Jesus? The devil's belief is not like that. Though. The moment Jesus shows up, they say, well, Who are you, son of David? Why have you come now? Why have you come? They, they become confused. He trembles. He said, But the difference is your works. So the only time you can trust is when you know the person of God. And the knowledge of God is imparted by God. I will be preaching here. What will touch you is the spirit of the utterance, not what I'm telling you. I heard apostle for a long time. I didn't even know what he was saying. But I, the more I heard him, the stronger my spirit became. The more resolute I became. The more strong and convicted I was about righteousness. Even though I didn't know what the man was talking about. I entered this hall and he was just talking. He said, you are small. And then somebody whispered in his heart, how can you say we are small? He said, ah, there's somebody here. You say, you, he said, you are small. He said, in this game, you cannot lead. You must have to be a, you have to align to one of the participators in the game. If not, you'll be a victim of the intersection of the spirit realm. I said, what is this person talking? <laughs> it comes from a place where I know who I am. Because I'm born of God, I overcome the world. You know, we, those were our scriptures. Him that is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, all things have passed away. And all things have become new. 
He said, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but giving unto them the word of reconciliation. He said, for he made him that was without sin to be seen for us, so that we can become the righteousness of God. Glory to God. I am the righteousness of God. This was our scripture. And then I'm entering the place and somebody say, you are small. What do you mean by that? <laughs> but the more we confess those scriptures the more the devil had authority over us so your brother is confessing that scripture and he's living a crusade but he's going home with a sister the scriptures are on his lips they are not in his heart I heard a man that was speaking to my heart that was when I realized that it is not the knowledge that makes a difference it is the spirit that is communicated in the knowledge if you don't know God, you can't impart God. If you know about God, you raise people that will also talk about God. Only a man that knows God can impart him. And God is known in the atmosphere of encounters. This is the protocol of trust. That's why you are sick, you can't receive your healing. But you know all the scriptures about healing. You have not separated yourself. If you separate yourself, you will receive an encounter. And for the first time, healing will make sense to you. You will receive it as a spiritual substance. All of us are saying the same thing. But the word is not responding. Because very few of us have the person we talk about. And after you have known God, then the next thing is the unveiling of the eternal purpose of God concerning your life. The reason God has to bring you to encounter and to knowledge before he reveals the purpose of your life to you is because the purpose of your life is always bigger than you. You, are not, you can't fulfill it except as God enables you. Any man you see fulfilling purpose is an enabled man. Without enablement, you can never fulfill purpose. So if God reveals it to you, it's a waste. You can't even know where you will fit in. God now said, if you go and confront Pharaoh and release the children of Israel, he has seen their cries. And Moses said, me? Pharaoh? <laughs> How do I, where do I stand in the courts of Pharaoh? I'm not even qualified to stand among the elders. How do I go to release Israel from? Do you know what we are talking? Over 3 million people who have been in, the, in bondage for 430 years. And then I go and show up and say, leave them. Imagine if you were the one. Imagine God now say, go and tell Buhari. <laughs> <laughs> How do you even get to Asso Rock? How do you get to the presidential villa? That one alone is a is crisis already for you. The only way this is possible is if God brings you into an atmosphere of an encounter. Because then, for the first time, you will see the essence and the magnitude of the one talking. And then he will also impart himself to you. And then the next thing is that he will cure you of your insufficiencies. Moses saw himself small. And God told him, don't worry. My presence will go with you. So the cure to insufficiency is the presence. And you can only interact with the presence in his own atmosphere. That's why many people are Christians for many years, but they don't carry the presence. Because they are not separated unto God. He said, do not worry. My presence will go with you. That's what makes all the difference. That's why Estabara can dare to preach the gospel. Because it's no longer about tongue. A man who don't have the presence is grossly insufficient. And if you know how significant the presence is, you will die in God's presence until he goes with you. That was why when God said, go, my angel will go with you. He said, no. If your presence don't go with us, we will not move. The man knew how insufficient he was. Apostle was teaching us yesterday. And he quoted Philippians 3 verse 3. He said, we are the circumcision that worship God in the spirit, rejoicing in Christ Jesus, having no confidence in the flesh. So the description of the circumcision is three. He worships in the spirit. 
He rejoices in Christ Jesus. He has no confidence in the flesh. So if you see a man who is a circumcision and he still has confidence in the flesh, he is not a circumcised person. The proof that you have become the circumcision is that your confidence shifts from yourself unto God. That's why I told you it's not about prayer. I was in God's presence for seven hours before coming for this meeting. And it means nothing if he doesn't come with me. And that's why I'm bold to talk to you as I'm talking. I'm not under pressure to inspire anybody. But if his presence came with me, even if the meeting seemed boring, something will travel with you that you can't deny. The next time you want to be responsible towards God, that thing will fight you. And you, the voice of the Holy Ghost will become louder. When you are alone, you are wasting away on social media. It will summon you and you can't deny it. Because the presence has gone with you. Now we started the move of power. Before we move in power, we have to. Everywhere has to be. Because if people's soul don't ascend and you try anything, you are in trouble. Sometimes we look for a song in the spirit. And when we get that song, but the time came when we could sense what God is doing. So as you stand, the spirit of God draws your attention to somebody and you go there. And as you are approaching the person, he says something. And as you tell the person that thing, something happens. No matter how dry the atmosphere is. But this will only happen when you become decircumcision. You must be separated. Most Christians are not separated. We come to church for activities. When we go home, everything about God ends. That's why God is not in the market. That's why he's not in the government. That's why he's not in the school. We only come to practice it in the church. We don't have him. He said, do not worry. My presence will go with you. If the presence of God doesn't go with you, you can't trust him. Because when you are alone and the challenges of life are screaming at you, the only thing that can make a difference is God. The only thing that can make a difference. And Moses was a wise man. He will go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh will refuse. He will go back to the one that said he will go with him. He will go to Pharaoh. Pharaoh will refuse. He will go back. And even when he left Egypt, you would think his challenge was over. But his challenge was not only Pharaoh. Even the children of Israel he came to save became a plague. They screamed at him. You brought us here to die. How do we cross the Red Sea? And then he looked at the one that said he will go with him. And he said, why do you turn to me? Stretch forth the rod. When you see a man doing signs and wonders, it's because he understands the technology of the presence. It's the presence that makes the difference. But you can only carry the presence if you are separated unto him. That's where responsibility comes to the Christian faith. They beg you to come for prayer meetings. You are a Christian. You are not serious though. And the challenges will continue in your family and in your society. Until you are made into a deliverer. Glory to God. And then the last thing is the empowerment. There are four things that engender trust. The first is encounters. The second is the knowledge of God. The third is the addressing of your insufficiencies by the presence. And the fourth is empowerment. In Exodus chapter 4, from verse 1 to 6. He said, what if they don't believe me? He said, when you go, tell them I'm the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He said, put down the staff that you carry. He put it down, it became a serpent. He said, take it by the waist, by the tail. He carried it. He said, in case they don't believe this one, put your hands in your bosom. He put it there, he brought it out, it became leprous. He said, put it back, he put it, he brought it out, it became normal. He said, even if they, if they don't believe this one, take water from the river, pour it on the ground, it will become blood. That's the empowerment. Until you have encounters, you know the Lord, you carry his presence, and you receive empowerment, you can't trust him. That's why you don't struggle with spiritual things. The moment you begin to struggle, you are failed. Go back. In spiritual things, we trust. We trust into manifestation. We don't struggle into manifestation. 
If you know you can't trust, go back and follow the protocol. This is what the wilderness does for you. It's not a place God organized for you to suffer. God is not interested in you suffering. But in order to qualify to do the biddings of God, you must have to trust Him. And it's only in the wilderness, it is only in separation that trust can be born. So that's the first thing the wilderness does, the betting of trust. The second thing is that the call is proven. You see, those five things I gave you was just to, to activate trust. The second thing is that the mandate, the call is proven. See, there are lots of people today, they receive training to become mature Christians, and then the next thing they say, they are apostles. The next thing they say, they are prophets. And they start a ministry and dislocate people from their destinies. That's why Apostle said one of the greatest challenges of the church today is dislocation. The guy who should be doing politics and learning how to grow in politics is putting a bishopric addressing himself as a prophet. And then he comes, tell you, marry this one, you go to Lagos, you go to Congo, and people are just scattered. In discipleship, there are two major ladders. The first ladder is to become a, an adult, a mature Christian. That one is for everybody. And that's the call of the fivefold. In Ephesians chapter 4, from verse 11 to verse 16, the Bible enumerated those things there. It said, to some he gave to be apostles, to some he gave to be prophets, to some he gave to be evangelists, pastors and teachers. For the perfecting of the saints. It's not for the perfecting of the apostles. For the work of the ministry. Until we all come into the fullness of the knowledge of, of Christ. Unto the fullness of the stature of Christ. So every mature believer is supposed to be like Christ. That you are like Christ does not mean you are sent. That you are seen visions does not mean you are sent. If God sends you, he gives you a definite mandate. Somebody is sent, is coming to ask you, what do you think we should call this ministry? What? What do you think we should call this ministry? And you are sent? <laughs> it's only Jesus that sent a man. In Mark 3 verse 14, it says, He called them to be with him, that he might send them. The apostles train you to become a mature believer. God calls you into consecration so that he can send you in consecration you are no longer being taught the character of the spirit you are expected to have received that tutelage from the fivefold ministry in consecration for sending god equips you for ministry in the order of the apostolic of the prophetic of the teaching the evangelist and the pastoral and that is why Every man who is sent knows his mandate. If you don't have a mandate, you are not sent. Don't waste your time. Go back to God and just do ministry. Submit to somebody and grow. They don't know their mandate. And when God gives you a mandate, He gives you a definite location. Because He's sending a lot of people. You can't come to this place and, and say, Remnant, you too, you are called... To, 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 for the rebirth of the of apostolic no, that mandate is for apostolic Roman. <laughs> he gave Moses the mandate and he sent him to Egypt so what the wilderness does for you is to confirm and to prove the call upon your life a man who is not separated cannot be proven Paul as mighty as he was, he saw Jesus. But he had to separate himself to the wilderness of Arabia. That was where he received the revelation he had for the body of Christ. Why Peter was an evangelical apostle, addressing cases of sickness, entering territories with the gospel, invading regions with the gospel. Paul was a teaching apostle. He was setting the coordinates for the church. This is how you live your life. This is how you worship God. This is what the church is. This is how the body is to operate. Peter didn't have those capacities. 
But for Paul to receive that utterance, he had to be separated to the wilderness of Arabia. John the Baptist, before he came, God has already out, I, I, itemized the blueprint of his life. Why does he still need some consecration? Because to know about it is different from knowing it. So John was separated. Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Jesus himself, the Bible said, as he was baptized. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, he said, he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he returned, in verse 14, the Bible said, he returned in the power of the Spirit. So the call is proven in consecration. Even if you are called a prophet, if you are not yet separated, you can never be a prophet. Because you, you are enthroned from the wilderness. You are not enthroned in the public. You manifest in the public. It is in the wilderness you are enthroned. But most Christians hate it. And then why would darkness not shut the potters? Because only babes are everywhere. There are more than 2,000 prophets. Just talking, talking, talking around, beating around the bush. There are more than 1,000 Christians in political corridors. Nobody can make any change. Because everybody is a babe. There are only few people who can make a mark. What is the call upon your life? And how much separation have you given to yourself in order for that call to be proven? These are simple but basic things. It's not to come and talk about big, big things that you don't even know the meaning. In your daily itinerary, how much time does God have? In your everyday life. Where is God in your life? You come to church every day. People are under pressure. Ministers are put under pressure to perform so that people are excited. And people are not becoming anything. Whereas the goal of the faith is transformation. Hallelujah. Amen. The last thing in the wilderness is the receipt of the mandate. Is the receipt of the mandate. Is the receipt of the mandate. The Bible said John the Baptist was in the wilderness until the, his day of showing forth unto Israel. And when John came out and they queried him, he said, why are you doing what you are doing? Who are you? He didn't say anything. He said, are you the Christ? He said, no, I'm not the one. Are you Elijah? He said, no, I'm not the one. Who are you then? Why are you doing what you are doing? And John made a statement that struck me. In John chapter 1 verse 33, he said, the one that sent me, he said, the same said unto me, when you baptize on whomsoever the Spirit of God descend and rest, he is the Christ. So he knew that he was the one to unveil the Christ. And he knew the technique by which the Christ should be unveiled. That's why he started baptizing. Before John, they sprinkled water on people to cleanse them. That was ceremonial cleanliness. But John's case, he came and immersed the people into water. Even if you are coming from a city, you wash your leg, wash your hand, wash your head and face, and you are cleansed. John was the one immersing people in water. The reason he was doing it was because he wanted to identify the Christ. It's not to do something new in town. That was the mandate. It was specific. Jesus said, the devil cometh not but for to kill, to steal, to destroy. He said, but I am come that you may have life and have it abundantly. I am come. This is why me I came. Why are you come? And you have been a Christian for 10 years, but you don't know why you are come. I was preaching in Oka and I told them something. I said Jesus was a good Christian. A good man. There's no Christianity that time. He was a good man for 30 years and nothing happened. But Jesus went into the wilderness as a carpenter. And after 40 days, he returned as light. He didn't just return as, as a man. He returned as light. A, a proven deliverer. 
the Bible said that it may be fulfilled that which was written by Isaiah the prophet. He said, In the land of Zebulun, in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, he said, The people that sat in darkness have seen a great light. The question is, Was he not living there with them before? What has happened all of a sudden? He had traveled through the wilderness. So the carpenter that went for 40 days came back as a light. Your own consecration may just be for 10 days. It may be for 5 years. The problem is, if you defile it, you will never become. And the day of your showing forth to be your worst day. Even the secular people understand this fact. Abraham Lincoln said, I will study and wait. He said, the opportunity will surely come. You prepare yourself. Don't just wake up and say, I'm a doctor because God told me I'm a doctor. You follow the process. Follow the process. These are basic things. They are basic things. But because we don't know these things, that's why our everyday life is littered with activities. But there is little obedience. Apostle said something. He said, as a young Christian, you are full of activity and little obedience. He said, but when you are grown, you are full of obedience and little activities. Little. Consecration is the key for the making of a deliverer. It is only in the gate of consecration that five of us can appear and God will see five of us as five nations. And suddenly, he said, you are a prophet. You are an orator. You are an ambassador. You are a judge. You are an elder. When we enter through concentration, we come out as refined lights. We don't come out as the same people that entered. We come out as entities in the spirit. But a lot of people are not concentrated. In recent times, whenever I have opportunity to minister here, I try as much as possible not to be charismatic. Because I have discovered that a lot of basic things have eluded us. A lot of basic things. The last time I ministered, I talked about the blood, the utterance of the blood. So that you know what it means to have confidence in God, the utterance of the blood. And a lot of people were walking in guilt because they didn't know the, what the blood has provided for. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So, consecration is the key. And in order to achieve consecration, obedience must be an everyday life. Obedience must be an everyday life. You see, when your obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. The thing is not just to stand up and start saying, Flanny die, I'm assuring you. I'm, a, I'm an instructor of church history. I know everything that happened from day one of the church day to day. The head apostles were slaughtered. Peter was crucified. Paul was slaughtered. James was thrown from the cliff. Imagine what will happen now if they tell you that they carry one, they slaughter one of the general of Asias. You will stand up and say, Kaya. Heaven, God will come down. No, ah, they are. <laughs> they have not even seen anything. They were killing them until they rose up. And the Bible said, This be the man that turned their world upside down. It was in their evangelical expedition that they conquered Constantine and he made Christianity the religion of the state. And Christians experienced peace. Because even if God kills one herald, another herald will rise. As you are not discipling, the people that you should win and disciple, that you are not winning and discipling because your witness is not sufficient, are the ones that the devil is winning and discipling. So when you see the disciples of the devil doing exploit, you should know that you are failing. And you may say you are not in the north, you are not in the north. Your next door neighbor drinks. What have you done about it? Everything that is happening, how many times have you rose up to intercede for it? You lie down, you sleep throughout the night, and you do that for one month. 
And then when things happen, you come and say, ah, hey, ah. and you are even praying in church and crying. Who told you your tears can move the mortars? <laughs> the Israelites cried for 400 years. And when God met Moses, he said, I have seen their tears. He said, I'm aware of their oppression. It's not like he was not aware. He was aware. The only way he can do something about it was to raise a deliverer. It's time for the church to rise. It's time for deliverers to rise. And the thing is not about the guy that looks like it. Most times the charismatic people are not the one God uses. Because they are the hardest people to break. The guy believes he knows what to say. The guy believes he look it. So he will always trust it. But the person that looks as if there is nothing, and he knows that he is defeated, it's easier for that person to trust. And it could just be you. But there is challenge. Our hearts are not even disturbed when we see these things. They say they killed 200 people. Reverend Donato stood here and he almost, he almost pulled down this building when he was praying on account of the body that was on his shoulders. And some of us were laughing. He said he cursed the Nigeria team. They will not win. They will come back. And people were laughing. There are no bodies. Things are happening. The church is affected. It doesn't move you. You come to church when they say it, you say, and you go home, you forget. Don't you see that you are sick? I sat here when Pastor Tony was preaching. And I say, God bless me with hunger. I say, God bless me with hunger. The reason we can pray for cars and houses is because we are in Benue. But very soon, if you don't rise, Benue will become Afghanistan. And the house you built all your life will be burned down in a second. And then you, that time your prayer will be, God, please, let me see tomorrow. Because next week will not be in view. Irresponsibility. The city that Paul labored in, labored in, the Bible said they took him outside of the gates, stoned him for death. The saints gathered, held their hands, and he rose up. And he entered again and began to pray. That city today is a Muslim nation. Because the likes of Paul were not replicated. If things are happening and you can slumber, what you need is to cry. You know why? Because you are still on earth, but you are no longer relevant to God. You are still alive. You are no longer relevant to God. You need to cry. You need to weep. If somebody has to talk before your heart is broken, there's a problem. A preacher has to do everything, do everything, stare himself, plan the line of his teaching so that somebody can be inspired. No. I didn't come to inspire you. I didn't come to motivate you. I came to show you what you need to do to become. So if you are willing to, you will do it. If you are not willing to relax, when we meet in heaven, we will not sit in the same place. I read the scripture. God was speaking to Ezekiel. And he said, if I tell a wicked man, you will die. And you don't tell him. He said, I will demand his blood of your hand. What do you mean? Am I part of his wickedness? Some of the things that are happening now, some people will take the blame. Because when God provided them with grace to stand and keep the gates, they were collecting political money. And now they come to speak as fathers, when others have labored to raise altars. They are already guilty while they are alive. He said, but if you tell him, you would have saved yourself. So you may think that man doing what he's doing does not bother you. You are the one God is looking at. You are calling God, but he's calling you. And it's when we get to heaven, we'll know who is calling who. And that's why you may call him from now till tomorrow. Nothing will happen. It's time for us to arise. You need to separate yourself. 
It's time to seek the face of God. It's time to cry for mercy. My message is not, not the type that comes to cut your heart. It's the type that comes to show you what you must do. And I'm persuaded that what I'm telling you now, the Holy Ghost has told a lot of you. You have just blocked and covered your ears. There are most of you that God has told you to wake up in the night to pray. But for the past six months, you have not rose up once to pray. There are most of you that God has told you specific things to do. But other things have taken possession of your soul. Today is a day to repent and to ask the Lord to bless you with hunger. I tried as much as possible not to be emotional, not to be charismatic. Because I want your will to make the decision. I don't want your emotions stimulated. If you are making a decision, it's because you have judged that everything that you require has been given to you and the Holy Ghost has been troubling your heart. But you have refused. Now you are willing and you are asking for grace. Our day and our world is growing darker. It's an opportunity for us to shine. Will you be amongst the people that God will count on in these last days? Can you bow your head and talk to Jesus? Bow your heads and talk to Jesus. Three years ago, I was sleeping and I, I felt a tap. And as I woke up, I heard, pray for Jonathan. Pray for Jonathan. And I said, Jonathan. I said, Lord, help Jonathan. And I slept. I was grossly irresponsible. Perhaps that would have enlisted me among those who can alter the protocol of leadership in this nation. But because I didn't take that responsibility, it may have been parted on my stature in the spirit. He said, pray for Jonathan. And I could not as much as I was, over, over, I was burdened by sleep. Two years ago, I stood up to pray in July, July 2016, there about. And as I knelt down to pray, I had this burden. I was summoned that night to pray. And I looked at the time. I, I was so tired. As I knelt down to pray, suddenly, my eyes opened. And I saw some beasts like crocodiles, but they stood like men. Coming, they were just appearing on different cliffs and were coming, waging war, waging war. They had these battens in their hands. And I didn't know where my own baton came from. I just had it. And then I started fighting, started fighting. Because I saw people were really contending with them. I didn't even know the people. And one of them came and called me. He said, lead these people to safety. Lead these people to safety. So as I was leading them, people who had money were giving me to keep for them. People were giving me things. And I woke up. And I heard a voice. I have enlisted you among the last days army. You will have a voice to bring people to repentance. From that day, every meeting I went for and preached, people cried. People cry. Even when I'm not preaching, people begin to cry. Their heart is caught. He showed me my own part. There are lots of things that heaven have destined for you to enter. For you have been grossly irresponsible. Today is the day of salvation. It's not all the time that your emotions should be stimulated. It's not all the time that you should hear charismatic preaching. Sometimes you should hear things, go back home and check. And check your life again. Check your life again. Check your life again. Come on, give me some more sound there.
nation of this nation. You've had those burdens. God have specifically asked you to pray at night. There are some of you that He has even given you the duration of such prayers. I want to pray for those people. You are in that category, come on. Let me pray with you. Not everybody. I say people that the Holy Ghost have told specifically to pray at night. Give me the song again. Jehovah, you see that most of you have been disobedient. Because you don't know the, the significance of that instruction. And you don't know the implication of that prayer. You have always felt it's still another of those. Those are the things that make men powerful. Mind you, it's not the church you come for every day and all of the activity you carry out. It is this one, this direct beating between you and the Holy Ghost that makes the difference. And that's what all of us have run away from. That's why the church is weak. Can you pour your heart to Jesus now? Pour your heart to the Lord. Pour your heart to the Lord. Let grace come upon you. Pour your heart to the Lord. Pour your heart. Pour your heart. Ask for mercy. Many people have died because you refused to start up and pray at that time. Some of the invasions we have now is because our voices, we could not complete the quorum in the spirit. Our voices were not heard. The angels were mobilized in heaven, but we couldn't partner with them on earth. So there was no invasion sufficient to stop that which the devil wanted to do. As we begin to sing it, there will be a vibration in the spirit. There will be a vibration. Some of you will literally see angelic beings now, now as we are here like this. And some of you will sense touch, touch from God, touch, touch. It will be impartation of grace to stand in the place of prayers. Not, nobody is strong. When you see somebody doing something, it's God and they put in him. As we take the song three times, things will begin to happen. There will be vibrations in the spirit. Go ahead, sister. Manta Sopra Sakabara Sopra.
as we were praying, as we were praying, the Spirit of God brought a witness to my spirit. Most of you here, the personal crisis you've had were supposed to have been addressed in the course of these prayers. Because there was an energy of God that was hovering over your life to bring you into those realities. But the gateway to accessing those things were those instructions given to you. I also received a knowing in my spirit that there's a young man here that the devil have put the fear of death in your soul for a long time. Same as if you are going to die, just feeling as if you are going to die, as if you are going to die. Fear of death. It was to suppress you from breaking into what God wanted to do in your life. The keyboard is play the song now. Only you play the song. You see, the power of God is a tangible thing. It's not something that is, it's not an emotional thing. It's a tangible thing. I'll ask a transparency. I'll ask for a transparency of the power. As it begins to touch, some of you will find yourself crying. Some of you, your hands become heavy, heavy, very heavy. Some of you will be slain. Don't be distracted. 